1974, America is hit by the most destructive tornado outbreak in recorded history. 148 tornadoes rip through 13 states, leaving millions of dollars of damage. But weather forecasters are unable to predict where or when the twisters will strike. As a result, five and a half thousand people are injured, 330 are dead. The nation reels in shock. I've never seen anything like it, and I don't want to again. A team of meteorologists investigate the aftermath in a bid to provide forecasters with new tools to save lives in the future. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. This girl has narrowly escaped being killed by a tornado. Now, trapped in a sinking camper van, she must cheat death again. North America, Missouri, Kansas City. April 3rd, 1974. Meteorologists at the Storm Forecast Center are extremely concerned. Their radar screens suggest that America's heartland is about to be struck by a massive tornado outbreak. Twisters hit every country on the planet, but the United States is struck by more than any other, with a thousand each year. The majority of these are small, and they affect an area of the Midwest between the Rockies and the Appalachians named Tornado Alley. Now the radar is showing worrying signs of a very powerful storm building. Dry winds have moved inland from the Pacific Ocean and are colliding with humid air driven north from the Gulf of Mexico. These are perfect conditions for thunderstorms. However, winds in the upper atmosphere limit thunderstorms from developing, creating unstable atmospheric conditions across a wide area. The meteorologists study their radar scope for the first signs of tornado activity. They've seen this kind of buildup before. On Palm Sunday, 1965, 48 tornadoes left a trail of destruction 760 kilometers long in a single night. The violent storms lasted 12 hours, devastating towns across Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana. Here, the death toll was the greatest. Entire families wiped out. In total, 1,500 people were injured. 271 died. The Palm Sunday tragedy exposed the Weather Service's inability to precisely predict where the tornadoes would strike. Their crude radar revealed where the storms would develop, but there was insufficient data to know which storms would be destructive and which would dissipate without harm. Nearly 10 years after the Palm Sunday outbreak, tornado prediction has barely improved. Meteorologists still find it difficult to anticipate where the most powerful twisters will strike. Now, forecasters face a tornado outbreak far worse than the Palm Sunday tragedy. One of thousands of cities in the Midwest is Xenia, Ohio. 12.45 p.m. At Xenia High School, 17-year-old Julie Smith is eating lunch with her friends. They discuss rehearsals for the school play, unaware that bad weather is heading their way. Julie's lived in Xenia since she was seven years old. It was great. There was one movie theater in town. That's where we all went on dates. Uh, there was one drive-in theater, you know, that the high school had dances. It was straight out of a postcard. I mean, it really was. Twenty-four kilometers from Xenia in Dayton, Ohio, 37-year-old Lucille Lehman is at work as an office administrator at an electronics company. 
she's distracted by thoughts of her daughter, Cecilia, who is recovering from a spinal operation. Cecilia passes the time at home by preparing the family meal. She always had lots of friends, always had friends, you know? She was very talented. She was in theater, and uh, I thought she was going to be my little movie star someday. By 2 p.m., meteorologists at the Storm Forecast Center are increasingly alarmed by the developing weather. Menacing thunderstorms have appeared on radar, and they cover a massive area from central Illinois to Tennessee. Afraid of repeating the mistakes of the Palm Sunday outbreak, they issue tornado warnings to television and radio stations across the central US. They know these warnings often go ignored, but without specific information, it's the best they can do. The severe thunderstorm warning has been changed to a tornado warning. 3.20 p.m. Lucille Lehman drives from work to her home in the center of Xenia to care for her kids after school. You've got the tornado sighted there. As she flicks through the channels on her radio, Lucille catches a warning that tornadoes are expected in the area. She hurries home as quickly as possible. Good gracious sakes alive. By 3.30 p.m., the bad weather is deteriorating. More than 20 twisters have been spotted moving across Tornado Alley. But so far, none of them have struck a city. Then, a massive twister appears on the outskirts of Xenia. Despite the warnings, thousands of people in the city are unaware of the impending disaster. A volunteer spotter sees it and immediately radios it in to the weather service. Yeah, we just had a tornado touchdown outside of town on Interstate 55. You copy that? At the storm forecast center, this is the call they dread. Hold on, hold on. Touchdown in Xenia. That's heading straight for the center of town. 3.32 p.m. In Xenia, Ohio, a tornado has just touched down and heads straight for the center of the city. At the high school, 2,000 kids have finished lessons for the day. But Julie Smith and 11 other teenagers in the drama group rehearsed the school play in the auditorium. At the same time, Julie's father, Albert, is driving to pick up his daughter after rehearsal. He's unaware a tornado is heading straight for the center of the city. At the high school, Julie's friend Ruth suddenly runs into the auditorium. Excited to see the twister, the teenagers run to the corridor. In my mind, I pictured the Wizard of Oz, you know. Oh, this little itty-bitty thing that we could go look at. But as the tornado approaches the school, they realize just how massive it really is. I remember thinking I was surprised there was no funnel. You know, no little itty-bitty thing. The children are frozen with fear. I think we were all shocked at what we saw. This huge thing that we couldn't even see the ends of it coming right at us. It sounded like something evil. And I remember thinking, I can't believe I'm going to die this way. I'm going to die in a tornado. 3.45 p.m. The Xenia tornado continues its trail of destruction. 
the home of Lucille Lehman and her four children, now lies directly in its path. Following government advice, Lucille opens the windows, hoping it will save the house from destruction. As the family looks in awe at the approaching twister, the powerful wind suddenly hits. PM. The tornado passes through the city and heads northeast into the countryside. In its wake, Xenia has been turned to matchwood. Hundreds of people now lie injured. In Xenia High School, the 12 teenagers who only moments ago were rehearsing the school play are now in shock, covered in cuts from flying debris. One of them is Julie Smith. I remember thinking how lucky I was to be alive. And I wondered how many people had died. Across Xenia, 33 people are dead. Many others lie trapped under collapsed buildings. The house of Lucille Lehman and her four children has taken a direct hit and been totally destroyed. 14-year-old Joe was thrown clear of the house, but is in shock. His mother and three sisters lie trapped in the remains. Cecilia, recovering from spinal surgery, is pinned under the crushing weight of a water heater. Neighbors pull Joe's eldest sister, Stephanie, from the wreckage. Then they rescue his youngest sister, Denise. As Lucille frees herself, she's overwhelmed by what she sees. You know, everything around me was level. She tries to help her daughter, Cecilia, who's still trapped. I could move my hands, but my lower half of my body was pinned. My legs felt numb. Xenia's roads are impassable and there is no sign of the emergency services. So neighbors are left to rescue Cecilia on their own. Julie's father, Albert, missed the tornado strike. As he enters Xenia, he sees that the city has been destroyed. Somewhere in this debris is his daughter but he has no idea if she is alive or dead. At the Lehman house, the neighbors finally release Cecilia from the rubble. Once I could feel the weight of things being removed, I knew I was gonna be okay. I just remember lying there, being grateful that I'm alive, being thankful to the people that dug me out. Four forty-seven p.m. On the outskirts of Monticello, Indiana, another monster tornado begins to form. As the twister rips through farmland, five girls sleep as Donald Richards drives his camper van home. The group have spent a week touring historical sites and are exhausted. Karen Stott remembers the trip well. We had gone to soak up church history and that was the last day of our trip. We'd been there a couple of days and it was time to come home. 5.05 p.m. The enormous tornado cuts its way through the Indiana countryside, building in power. Inside the camper van, Donald Richards and the five girls have no idea that the twister is just behind them. As it gains on the van, the tornado builds in strength and speed. As they begin to cross the Tippecanoe River, 
the Twister finally catches them. It picks up the van and tosses it over 15 meters into the river below. When it hits the water, the vehicle starts sinking fast. When the bus went down, I saw two people, my teacher and my friend. I never saw anybody else. I don't know where they were. Karen's friends are seriously injured. They were, they, they were unable to get away. They were not able to, to fight for themselves. As the van sinks deeper into the river, Karen manages to escape. Struggling against the ferocious winds, she somehow summons the strength to swim to shore. I had to fight very hard to survive, and my drive to survive was extremely strong. And I just began swimming as hard as I could. I truly saw my life go right before my eyes, but I somehow, by the grace of God, did not die. So. As the tornado moves across open country, Karen finally reaches the riverbank. She's exhausted, but alive. Her friends are less lucky. The bus sinks beneath the water. In Xenia, Albert finally reaches his daughter's high school to discover it's been totally destroyed. I was take a quick look. How do you know that? But they're not here, sir. He's told there were no survivors. Go home. Call somebody. Albert is grief-stricken. He drives aimlessly through the devastated city. Julie! He finds it hard to believe that his daughter is dead. Suddenly, he sees a figure. It's Julie. She's alive. Julie! Are you okay? Honey. I'll never forget the look on his face. I'll never forget him crying, and I'll never forget. Him giving me the hug. The violent storms continue until 5 a.m. the following morning. In total, 148 tornadoes rip through Tornado Alley. Six of them are thought to be F5s, the most powerful twisters known to man. As day breaks on April 4th, the scale of the devastation is shocking. Just as the meteorologists had feared, this outbreak is far worse than the Palm Sunday tragedy of 10 years earlier. Damage to property is estimated to be over $600 million, 2.3 billion in today's money. Five and a half thousand people have been injured, 330 are dead. President Nixon visits Xenia in an effort to offer support to the shattered community. He goes to the wrecked school where Julie Smith and the drama group were so lucky to survive. As communities across America reel in shock, the Army and Air Force are called in to help clean up the thousands of smashed homes. Once again, the Weather Service's inability to accurately predict tornado strikes has resulted in tragedy. Now, by going deep into a scientific investigation, we can reveal how the tragic events of the 1974 outbreak changed tornado forecasting forever.
A day after the tornado outbreak, Dr. Ted Fujita from the University of Chicago races to work. The storm that caused so much suffering could provide him with a unique opportunity. Fujita is convinced that an investigation into the outbreak could save lives in the future. At the university, Fujita rushes his students and staff into a meeting. He tells the team his radical plan. If his hunch is right, they might learn more about tornadoes in the next few days than meteorology has learned in decades. In the group is Fujita's protege, Greg Forbes. Even at that time, Dr. Fujita had the reputation of being Mr. Tornado. If there was any one person that you looked to for studying tornadoes, Dr. Fujita was it. Shoot as much as you can from in the amount of daylight that we have. Fujita explains his plan to the team. By flying over the paths of the tornadoes, he hopes to photograph patterns of debris left on the ground and build up a complete picture of the twister's strength and behavior. By matching this data to radar images taken during the outbreak, Fujita hopes to discover clues that will help meteorologists predict where and when tornadoes will strike in the future. His earlier research has taught him that in Tornado Alley, Twisters are normally caused when humid winds from the Gulf of Mexico move north and collide with colder, drier winds from the west. As the warm wind rises, it converges with these colder winds, causing horizontal rotation. Heat from the ground produced by the sun makes the warm air rise even further. Finally, it pushes itself up through the colder layer, creating a funnel that spins upward as a tornado. These violent funnels can cause devastating damage, striking any American state. But they predominantly hit Tornado Alley in the spring and summer. In 1974, meteorologists monitor Tornado Alley with radar. The images generated by this radar help them recognize early signs of storms which are likely to generate twisters. But the scans are too crude to reliably predict the exact locations where the most dangerous tornadoes will form. Gathering data in real time on the ground is also difficult. Tornadoes are unpredictable, appearing and disappearing in minutes. Even if it was possible to get monitoring equipment into them, it would almost certainly be destroyed. Tornadoes were the big mystery phenomenon. Nobody flies an airplane into a tornado and, and lives to report their measurements. So a lot of unknown. If Fujita's plan works, they could help hundreds of people survive tornadoes in the future. But with a cleanup operation already underway, Fujita and his team must work fast. The question is, where do they start? We gathered up the newspapers. Uh, we called National Weather Service offices and got reports we put little dots on the map so we didn't have to just go randomly looking at every square mile of, of the whole state of Illinois and Indiana and Ohio and so forth. The following morning, the team divides into groups. Greg and a colleague rush to their hired plane. They only have a narrow window of opportunity before vital evidence left by the tornadoes disappears forever. We needed to get out there pretty quick before they started cleaning up the debris and sort of muddying over the, the, the clues that the tornadoes had left. Within 45 minutes, Greg Forbes is at the scene of the first tornado. The chaos beneath him is bewildering. But as patterns start to emerge from the debris, Forbes realizes that Fujita's plan might just work. Determined to find some good in the wake of this disaster, student Greg Forbes from the University of Chicago is flying over the paths left by the tornadoes to photograph the debris. Despite decades of tornado analysis, very little is known about these dangerous phenomena. Forbes is stunned by what he sees. Louisville, Kentucky, 
and Xenia, Ohio, have been laid to waste. By photographing this destruction, Forbes can determine the precise direction, power, and speed of the tornadoes. He can then compare these pictures to radar images taken during the tornado outbreak. This could reveal which cloud formations are associated with the most destructive tornadoes, and help meteorologists better predict where the most dangerous twisters will strike. Over two days, Forbes documents as much evidence as possible. He knows how important this survey could be. I knew that there was the potential that what I was studying there could help with future tornado episodes and perhaps save lives. When Forbes returns to the University of Chicago, he shows the team the photos from his aerial survey. Debris is scattered over large areas from the force of the tornado. But as Forbes examines the images in detail, he discovers a number of puzzling phenomena. It has long been reported that the destruction left by a tornado can sometimes leave houses completely untouched. This photo is dramatic evidence of this strange phenomenon. The prevailing theory is that some tornadoes miss buildings because they occasionally lift into the air. But Fujita isn't convinced by this idea. He asks the team to study the photographs in greater detail and search for further explanation. Another bizarre anomaly is found in Monticello, Indiana. The Monticello tornado behaved normally for the first 21 kilometers. But then it did something extremely unusual. Just when it should have died out, it gained a new lease of life and traveled for a total of 195 kilometers, killing 19 people, including Karen Stott's friends who drowned in the Tippecanoe River. The aerial photographs present Forbes and Fujita with other questions they can't answer. Since the 1950s, the government has advised the public to open windows before tornadoes strike. The belief is that opening windows balances the pressure inside and outside the structure and stops it from exploding. Watch this demonstration. Low pressure in the vortex causes walls and roofs to explode outwards. This occurs because of higher pressure inside. But nowhere in the aerial photographs can Forbes and Fujita see evidence of debris exploding in all directions, as the government suggests. While the team search for answers, Forbes and Fujita move on to the next stage of the investigation, a ground survey. By collecting evidence on the ground, they hope to gather more precise information about the behavior and the timings of each tornado. Fujita heads to Xenia, Ohio. Forbes goes to Louisville, Kentucky. One of the most important pieces of evidence are stopped clocks. They show the exact time the tornado hit and allow Forbes to accurately compare the destruction on the ground to images of cloud formations captured on radar. One of the primary things that we were looking for was the time that it hit, so that we could then relate that to the known times of the images that were snapped of the radars. Forbes also speaks to eyewitnesses, who give detailed descriptions of how the tornado destroyed buildings. We were looking for any kind of idiosyncrasies, things like missiles, asking them what happened, what did they see, what did they experience. Knowing those kind of things could help us relate where the tornado occurred in relation to the parent thunderstorm. Then in Xenia, Fujita has a breakthrough. He hears of a 15-year-old boy called Bruce Boyd, who filmed the Xenia tornado for over two minutes using a home movie camera. Fujita can't believe his luck. In 1974, film of tornadoes is extremely rare. We didn't have video cameras at the time that are so pervasive today. We didn't have all sorts of movies of 
hundreds of tornadoes per year that are captured on film. By studying the moving images of the twister, they use a process called photogrammetry to analyze the movement of debris caught in the funnel. This helps them to assess speed, direction, and power. It's a technique that gets dramatic results. In 1965, Fujita used it on photographs of tornadoes taken during the Palm Sunday outbreak. His study of the images helped develop the Fujita, or F scale, which is still used around the world today. An F1 causes minor damage and can down power lines. An F2 can roll a car. An F3 can overturn a train. The F4 is monstrous and can flatten well-constructed houses. Finally, the most feared and rarely sighted F5 can have wind speeds of up to 512 kilometers an hour. The F5 is the most powerful wind known to man. Dr. Fujita and his protege, Greg Forbes, returned to Chicago with Boyd's unique film of the Xenia tornado. When they analyze the footage, they find startling evidence for a phenomenon that Fujita has long suspected, but has never been able to prove. He believes that some tornadoes actually have a number of smaller funnels, which dance around the parent as it plows its destructive path. The Boyd movie is certainly very spectacular. It periodically has a couple of multiple funnels that are dancing around, pirouetting about each other in the midst of revolving about the parent tornado. Bruce Boyd's film perfectly captures these multiple funnels in action. The investigation makes progress in other areas, too. After hours of painstaking analysis, the team find no evidence in the aerial photos of buildings exploding in every direction as previously thought. But they discover that debris caught in the funnel of a tornado can act as high-velocity missiles which can seriously damage structures. These missiles, combined with the power of winds exceeding 322 kilometers an hour, explain why buildings are destroyed. They're actually being blown over with massive force, although to a bystander, it looks like they're exploding. Forbes immediately realizes the significance of this information. Not only does government advice to open windows do nothing to save buildings, it actually puts people's lives at risk because they waste precious moments when they should be finding shelter. This new information will help save many lives in the future. The team then get lucky. They discover a second piece of film, capturing a tornado in action. In Parker, Indiana, news cameraman Wally Hubbard was caught in a hailstorm and forced to stop his car. Spotting a tornado, he instinctively reached for his news camera. Forbes and Fujita study debris captured in Hubbard's film. They take precise measurements of wreckage caught in the funnel using photogrammetry. Their analysis of the images confirms that wind speeds inside the Xenia tornado reached a spectacular 483 kilometers an hour. Their research finally explains why some buildings remain untouched during a strike. But critically, they discover that multiple funnel tornadoes hold another deadly secret. The addition of the smaller funnels can make some tornadoes even more dangerous because they add another destructive layer of wind. By revolving about the parent tornado and having its own circulation, that would add yet another layer of additional wind speeds. This is an important leap in understanding twisters, but it isn't the breakthrough that will help scientists better predict tornadoes in the future. They decide that to find the forecasting tools they need, they will have to go back to the radar images recorded during the outbreak. As Forbes searches these images for clues, 
his attention is drawn to cloud patterns called hook echoes. They're given this name because of their distinctive hook shape. Weather radar was first introduced across the US in the 1940s. Since then, these hook-shaped cloud formations have often been observed during a tornado outbreak. However, the hooks vary, and meteorologists are unable to pinpoint which hooks create the most dangerous tornadoes. As Forbes looks through the radar images, he hopes he has enough information to make the breakthrough he's searching for. We went and printed every image from those radar microfilms and then categorized what was the shape of the parent echo. Was it a well-defined hook echo with a little curly cue at the end? Or was it some more kidney bean shape? Or was it something else? Sure enough, Forbes sees a connection. Each of the six F5 tornadoes formed during the outbreak was created from a hook echo, which lasted between five and seven hours. This is what Forbes and Fujita have been searching for. By looking for long-lasting hook echoes during an outbreak, meteorologists will now be able to predict with accuracy where and when the most lethal tornadoes will strike. We'd never had anything like this before. After this discovery, which will save countless lives in the future, Fujita turns to the final mystery of the April 3rd outbreak, the Monticello tornado. It was unusual in that it was a very, very long tornado. It just kept going and going and going. I would never have predicted that that particular thunderstorm would have produced a 100-mile-plus tornado path. Why did the Monticello twister travel so far? Forbes and Fujita go back to the aerial photos and search for anything which might explain why it continued for over 160 kilometers further than usual. It is Fujita who spots something out of the ordinary. As well as the normal twisting marks left by a tornado, he finds evidence of a completely different type of ground damage. There were some places in the damage pattern from the super outbreak that didn't quite fit the tornado mold. Fujita proposes that this ground damage was caused by dramatic bursts of air dropping from directly above, a phenomenon he calls downdrafts. When warm air rises in a thunderstorm, it eventually cools and begins to fall back to Earth. Fujita's theory is that sometimes this cool air rushes back at great speed descending rapidly down the trailing edge of a thunderstorm in a destructive burst. He believes that if a downdraft had combined with a tornado in Monticello, the tornado could have been given an injection of energy that allowed it to travel further than usual. The photographic evidence of a downdraft in Monticello is tantalizing, but it isn't enough to prove that they exist. Despite this disappointment, Forbes and Fujita's hard work produces a spectacular map of the entire tornado outbreak. Each black mark represents the path of a tornado in miles. They reveal that the total distance covered by all the twisters is 4,000 kilometers. Fujita's investigation into what becomes known as the super outbreak is a scientific milestone. It is the most comprehensive study of tornadoes ever undertaken and amasses a wealth of new data. It debunks the dangerous myth that opening windows stops houses from exploding and proves there's no scientific evidence that tornadoes skip. It reveals that tornadoes sometimes form unpredictable multiple funnels. And most importantly of all, the investigation also proves that the longest-lasting hook echoes create the most dangerous twisters. This becomes a vital tool in the prediction of the most lethal tornadoes and gives meteorologists a much better chance of warning the public in the future. On several levels, the super outbreak went a long way toward eventually reducing casualties from tornadoes. 
Dr. Fujita publishes a report on his findings. It receives great acclaim from the scientific community. But Fujita was never able to prove his radical downdraft theory or explain why the Monticello Twister traveled for over 190 kilometers. Then, one year after the super outbreak, he receives an unexpected phone call. A plane carrying 124 people has inexplicably crashed. The National Transportation Safety Board want to know if freak weather conditions could have been responsible. Although Fujita has no way of knowing it, this seemingly unconnected tragedy will lead him to solve the downdraft mystery once and for all. Dr. Fujita from the University of Chicago has gathered data from the worst tornado outbreak in US history. His findings have changed meteorology's understanding of tornadoes forever. It was one of those defining moments that got people uh, aware of the tornado problem and you know, helped set in motion steps toward improving the situation. However, Fujita was unable to solve one puzzle. Why the tornado that hit Monticello traveled for 195 kilometers, over 160 further than usual. A year after the super outbreak, Fujita is called to New York to help investigate the crash of Eastern Airlines Flight 66. As the passenger jet approached JFK's runway, it mysteriously slammed into the ground, killing 115 passengers and crew. Could the crash have been the result of freak weather conditions? Fujita starts by analyzing the telemetry details stored in Flight 66's black box. He then studies black box data from other planes flying that day and from atmospheric readings taken on the ground. He builds up a picture of what may have happened in the air before the plane crashed. Fujita is surprised by what he finds. A series of small downdrafts, which he calls microbursts, interfered with a number of planes that day as they landed at JFK. It was these microbursts that literally pushed Flight 66 into the ground, just short of the runway. He quickly discovered that there were some fairly small diameter, but very intense downdrafts that were occurring in a pulsing mode over the airport that allowed some of the airplanes to, to land without incident, others having great difficulty and one crashing. Realizing that other planes could be in danger, Fujita publishes his findings. The aviation industry rapidly upgrades radar at airports across America in order to detect this atmospheric anomaly before it kills again. For Fujita, it's a double victory. His research proves that the ground damage seen in Monticello a year earlier, caused by dramatic bursts of air, can be attributed to a downdraft. It was this freak atmospheric anomaly which energized the Monticello tornado and caused it to travel for 195 kilometers with devastating consequences. This is the final piece of Fujita's puzzle. Finally, we can reveal the critical chain of events which plunged 13 American states into a catastrophic clash with the power of Mother Nature. April 3rd, 1974. Winds move inland from the Pacific Ocean and Gulf of Mexico, creating highly unstable atmospheric conditions across Tornado Alley. Forecasts suggest America is about to be hit by the worst tornado outbreak in a decade. But meteorologists don't know exactly where or when the most dangerous tornadoes will strike. They send out blanket warnings, but they're too general and too late. By 3.30 p.m., a tornado touches down on the outskirts of Xenia, Ohio. Many people are taken by surprise. They waste valuable time opening windows to prevent their houses from exploding. 
Xenia is obliterated by high-velocity missiles and winds. Incredibly, some buildings survive the tornado's multiple funnels. At 4.47 p.m., a tornado touches down on the edge of Monticello, Indiana. The population is caught unaware. It kills 19 people. Turbocharged by a downdraft, this tornado then travels across open country for a further 170 kilometers. At 5 a.m. on April 4th, the outbreak finally ends. 16 hours after it began, cities are reduced to matchwood. 148 tornadoes cause $600 million worth of damage. Five and a half thousand people are injured. 330 are dead. Dr. Ted Fujita died in 1998. Greg Forbes is employed by the Weather Channel and continues his work as a meteorologist. His ability to predict the weather today is greatly enhanced by modern technology. High quality satellite images can show developing weather in real time and mobile Doppler radar can probe deep inside tornadoes. The benefits to the public as a result of these new tools came as a direct consequence of lessons learned from the 1974 super outbreak. A dedicated radio service now broadcasts Remember, the latest tornado, severe weather information and tornado sirens have been installed across America's heartland. Dr. Fujita's investigation was an early stepping stone towards science's understanding of tornadoes. To this day, his findings still play a part in saving lives around the world 